السلام عليكم أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين I've been back uh, in Canada for four years now and uh, so you see my pace is a little bit different we're a little bit more relaxed in Canada, alhamdulillah. I was just telling uh, Dr. Rami and Dr. Jackson that uh, we have a lot of vacation. We have years maternity leave, not that I can use it anymore. Uh, 26 weeks uh, family care leave, if you have someone sick in your family. All of these are paid, of course. Believe me. Good social policies make a difference in people's lives. To be able to have the time to, to care for your family, to care for the young, to care for the old, to care for the sick, to check in on your neighbor, to be able to have some financial support when you're in trouble, all of these things are, are what make a just society. And it really matters being involved in these issues or being a part. Because so many people who are frazzled and tired and sick and unable to really pay attention to their kids, to care for the elderly, they feel horrible about their lives. And it's the result of terrible social policies and economic policies in this country. And that's the reality. And if we don't get involved on the policy level, we can help with our soup kitchens and we can do some Band-Aid measures and we should do those. But to do the kind of um, uh, collective action uh, to address legislation and policy is really what's going to make a difference in people's lives. It's so critically important. And it is very overwhelming. I understand that. There are so many different issues. But what Brother Rami shows us is that this is a question of far kafaya, of a collective obligation. To have an organization like Iman that does the research, that understands the issues, and then is able to tell us, help us by voting this way, by calling the congressman or congresswoman, you know, whoever it is uh, that will make a difference. We don't have to know the details about every issue. We can't know the details about every issue, but we need as a community to work with Muslim organizations, interfaith organizations, social justice organizations that do understand these issues, be on their mailing list, be on their calling list, and help where we can. And as Brother Rami said, you know, take an issue about which uh, you're particularly passionate about and pick it up. And that way we can really make uh, some progress, inshallah. And so much needs to be done. I mean, I really feel that the, the amount of suffering in this country now, the amount of people who just simply are not even getting a fair wage is, is really shocking. Uh, this is Labor Day weekend. And we should here at ISNA take some time to really think about what that means. It is because of the labor movement that we enjoy so many of the rights that we have today. Right to a fair workplace, uh, the abolition of child labor, um, to be able to complain when there's sexual harassment or bullying, uh, to have a wage that gives some sort of decent compensation for a person. All of these things are part of our faith. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has many teachings about treating the worker well. For example, he said, pay the worker before the sweat of the, uh, on his brow dries. And today, there are millions of workers in America who have had to sue their employer because they didn't get paid for work that they've done. So 
you know, it, it's easy for us to, to look at issues around us sometimes and think, well, that's not an Islamic issue or that's not a Muslim issue. I need to prioritize Islamic or Muslim issues. But when we look, in fact, at the teachings of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, what the Qur'an says, we should understand that being a Muslim is not about identity. It's not about having that Islamic or Muslim label on it. It is about living the ethics of the Qur'an and Sunnah, living the morality, living the behavior and the character uh, that is give, described to us as good character, as just character, as as what it means to be fair. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Anisa gives us a, a kind of summary of what those obligations are. In translation, uh, this uh, verse, verse 36 says, Worship God. Of course, it all begins with worshiping God. Because if we don't submit ourselves to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we will continually feel the pull of our greed and selfishness and wanting to simply just take care of ourselves and our nafs. So it begins with this worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Worship Allah and do not ascribe a partner to Him. Treat your parents with the greatest kindness. We can't go and do things and uh, ignore our parents. And parents includes those elderly people who are related to us, who are in our community. They might not necessarily be our own mother and or father, but they are the mothers and fathers of our community. Also, so treat with, treat with great kindness, the greatest kindness your parents, as well as relatives, orphans, the neighbor who is close to you and the neighbor who is far, your friends, the migrant, which I think is the best translation of Ibn Sabid, Ibn Sabid in the Quran, we would say migrant, so that would include all sorts of people who are on the move and homeless and don't have a permanent place to live or a safe place. And also your captives, so the captives of war. God does not love the, those who are conceited and arrogant. And here is the key for what will make this work joyful, what will make us work together as respectable and, and respected brothers and sisters to care for each other, to be able to uh, work for all of these causes without stigmatizing the other person who might not be on board our cause or might see a different priority. This is at the end of describing all of these obligations, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that he does not love those who are conceited and arrogant. And this is where we see that in some social justice work, some people swerve away. There's a certain conceit and arrogance in saying my way, the tactics I use, the strategy I use, my perspective on this issue is the right one and everyone else is a bad Muslim is a hypocrite, is not on board, is selfish, without really engaging in conversation. And it is this etiquette that is so critical, because otherwise we will end up squabbling and not being able to accomplish anything whatsoever. It is really important that we, in our work together with all that we have to do, that we don't set litmus tests for each other that if you do not get involved in this cause in my way, you must be a hypocrite, or you can't care, you don't really care, or you're this kind of Muslim or that kind of Muslim. It is so easy for us to fall in those kind of disagreements. You know, 29 years ago was my first ISNA convention in Dayton, Ohio. And I think about the passage of time. You know, I wasn't married, I didn't have any kids, I was a new Muslim, I was, had just applied to the University of Chicago for my doctoral dissertation, and time, time just flies. But two years later, at my next, next ISNA convention, I came back to Chicago, starting my graduate school, starting my doctoral program with a lot of questions. And those questions I've tried to answer in the last three decades. And, and at the heart of, the, of, of all of those questions is this. Why are so many Muslims fighting with each other? 
And why is it so easy for us to call each other names and to cut each other off? Because in those two years, I went to work in a refugee camp or a bunch of refugee camps in northern Pakistan when the Soviets were occupying Afghanistan. And there was an active war going on and Muslims and Christians and intelligence services and all sorts of people came from all over the world to go and either help those people or help themselves or voice their ideological agenda on those poor people who had to flee their country, millions of Afghan people. And, and there I saw the best and the worst of humanity. I saw great Muslim men and women who were working together, like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and working together for the common good. And I saw men who absolutely oppressed women in the name of Islam. And I saw Muslims who were trying to work on one project and others who made takfir so easily because of their beliefs, their theology, uh, their school of thought. So I came back here to this city and to this university on the south side and I said, I, have to, I don't understand, why did this happen? I studied theology and I studied history and I studied law and the development of all of these schools of thought. And there's a lot of complex answers, there's a, there's a lot of history back there. What we should know, and I think you know, what it comes down to is this, is that politics, political engagement will always be difficult. We will, there will always be different perspectives. We will feel very passionately and strongly about these things. Even the companions, the blessed companions of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they had terrible disagreements, even resorting to the force of arms about political matters immediately after the death of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And we're living with those disagreements, some of those disagreements until today. So anyone who's seeking some kind of uh, utopian political or social order in Islam will make themselves miserable and will make others miserable around them. They will be deeply disappointed and they will seek uh, the most ridiculous solutions because a utopia can only be a fantasy. Still, we have to be involved. We have to try. We have to do our best. We can't separate ourselves out from it because it's messy, because it's difficult, because we'll argue. But at the very least, we should remember, if at the heart of all of it, we humble ourselves, we shun arrogance, and we will become arrogant, so we just have to simply remind ourselves, don't be arrogant, don't be arrogant. Then, inshallah, we will be able to have some measure of success. We will be able to move together somehow uh, in the future. We are so embedded in the issue of the day, right? We're so embedded in the issue of the day. But I remember 15 years ago when I was elected vice president, a week before 9-11, we had so many issues then. And a week after 9-11, we had many other issues. And for 10 years, you know, that I was involved in this executive, we worked so hard, traveled so much, so many meetings and sleepless nights and advocacy and speaking. And all of that's important, and I'm glad, alhamdulillah, and feel so blessed I was able to witness all of the khair, all of the goodness in this community and other communities. But subhanAllah, I don't confuse all of that work really with my, with me measuring, you know, my relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I don't look at whether we succeeded in some material sense. Yes, we tried. Inshallah, there were some things that were good, there were some that were bad, and we have to be accounted for that. But in the end, this world is in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, this universe is in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we do, you know, maybe this is the cool Canadian in me, but sometimes we do just have to step back and take a breath and, and remember, 
I'll finish with this. To me, the most, you know, in some ways amazing, earth-shattering, sh and also comforting ayah of the Qur'an to me is the beginning of Surat Al-Insan. هَلْ أَتَى عَلَى الْإِنسَانِ حِينُ مِنَ دَحْرِ لَمْ يَكُنْ شَيْئًا مَذْكُورًا Can you imagine a time, a, a, a time of the epochs when you never were even a thing mentioned? You put your mind back to that. It was just a very short time ago. We, we didn't exist and our parents didn't exist. So we weren't even that dream that our parents would one day have us. You know, never mentioned. Time is long, very long. If you go, go I, I highly recommend Werner Herzog's documentary, Cave of Forgotten Dreams. Look what people, hum, human beings 30,000 years ago did through their drawings. Their hopes, their dreams, they're trying to connect with the divine. 30,000 years ago. You know, we are here for a very, very, very brief time. We should work hard. We should try. But in the end, we're just, we're just a drop in the bucket. And others will come after us and others after them as long as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants there to be people on this earth. So remember your role. Remember your true origin, and that will keep us calm, it will keep us focused, and we'll never despair. We'll be full of joy, and that's the joy we should have, because what is the next uh, ayah in Surat al-Insan after this? We... Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says he guided us to the path. He guided humanity to the path. And either you're grateful or you're ungrateful. That's it. You know, it's about gratitude. If you're, gra if you're grateful, you're going to be humble. If you're grateful, you're going to want to share. If you're grateful, you're going to want to show your gratitude by serving the, all the creatures of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you'll do it with joy, not with misery. And making people so, so, you know, worried and disturbed and with a frown on your face all the time. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us and guide us and give us that strength and give us that joy and that courage to do the work we need together out of love for him, for the face of Ar-Rahman. As-salamu alaykum.